All right, you guys, we have just about finally finished this incredible 12 lead EKG series. This is the last and final lesson of this series. In the previous lesson, we talked about our STEMI mimics, but if you remember, I mentioned with some of these depolarization abnormalities giving us the STEMI mimics, that these patients can still also have AMIs, making it more difficult to identify. Well, one such method to help us do just that is called Scarbose's criteria, and we'll discuss that in this lesson now. All right, I welcome you guys back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and my goal with this channel here is to try to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that. If I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel below. Uh, make sure you hit that bell icon, though. That way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Now, also, if you do enjoy these lessons and you'd be interested in getting CE credits for following along with them, um, then head on over to icuadvantage.com forward slash academy and join the ICU Advantage Academy where you can watch all these videos. You'll have access to all the notes, including the new notes that I'm currently working on updating, as well as audio only versions of these lessons. And most importantly, you'll be able to actually earn CE credits for participating in this education. So I've got some great deals going on over there, so make sure and check that out. Now, if you would like to support the channel but really don't have a need for the CEs, or if you just want access to things like the notes, then you might also want to take a look at either the YouTube or Patreon memberships. Again, links to both of those. All that stuff is going to be down in the description below. Okay, this has been one heck of a journey through so many aspects of our 12-lead EKG interpretation. We've covered a ton of information over the last 14 lessons. Wow, I can't even believe that number. This is by far the longest series to date. In this lesson, we need to cover one last thing to round out the topics that we covered in this series. And remember that there are so many more things that we didn't cover here, as well as some things that you can learn so much more about. So I do truly encourage you to continue to learn more on your own about this complex subject. That said, and like I mentioned in the intro, we need to talk about the final piece of being able to still identify acute myocardial infarction in patients who have depolarization abnormalities. The way that we can do this is with a set of criteria that we call Scarboza's criteria. So let's start off with a little background and quick overview of what this is. So Scarboza's criteria is a set of rules that were really identified in 1996 to help identify AMI patients who have a left bundle branch block. So Dr. Elena Scarboza and her team were really looking at data from a famous study of that time, looking at the use of thrombolytics to help rule in or rule out patients for AMI. They took a look at a subset of the patients who had a left bundle branch block and tried to find a pattern in those who were ruled in for AMI as opposed to those who were ruled out. They ended up finding a pattern and created a set of rules that were really a game changer for being able to identify AMI in these patients. Because prior to that, the, the school of thought was that in a patient who has a left bundle branch block that you can't possibly identify them having a STEMI. So for Scarboza's criteria, there are three criteria, uh, which I'll be covering in just a bit here, that if any of them are met, that this can be specific for STEMI, and the more criteria that's present, the greater the sensitivity. Later on, Dr. Smith, again the same Dr. Smith from the ECG blog I mentioned last lesson, came along and made a slight modification, something that we refer to as Smith's modification to Scarboza's criteria, which Dr. Scarboza herself later endorsed. This modification helped to improve the accuracy of these criteria. Now, one thing to note is that this criterion was identified in patients with left bundle branch block. Subsequently, it was determined that this can also be used in patients with ventricularly paced rhythms. However, it is less specific. There's also been some speculation about this being beneficial in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy with a strain pattern. Again, another STEMI mimic we talked about in that last lesson. But the evidence isn't as clear on this one, and even Dr. Smith has comment about it, stating that it really needs further investigation before determining the accuracy and if any other modifications are necessary. 
So the important takeaway is that in patients with left bundle branch block and even patients with ventricularly paced rhythms, that we have a set of criteria that we can use to evaluate these patients and help to identify STEMI. That said, just because these criteria are not present does not mean you can rule out STEMI. All right, so now let's cover what criteria are included in Scarboza's criteria. I'm actually going to be discussing Smith's modification to Scarboza's criteria here, but before we begin, remember that in left bundle branch block from our previous discussion on those STEMI mimics that we have something we call the rule of appropriate T-wave discordance. We expect to see the T wave in the opposite direction of the predominant R or S wave, as well as the J point pulled in the direction of the T wave, giving us the appearance of either ST depression or ST elevation. Now knowing this, if we see something that we call concordant ST elevation or depression, that this can actually be an indicator of STEMI. And here concordant means that we have ST elevation or depression that's going the same direction as the predominant R or S wave. Again, I'll show examples of that here in just a minute to help make this point make more sense for you. All right, so on to the criteria. Like I said, we have three criteria that we are evaluating. We're looking for concordant ST elevation, concordant ST depression, and proportionally excessive discordant ST elevation. So starting off with the concordant ST elevation. For this, we would have a predominantly positive R wave, as you can see in this example here. And instead of the J point being pulled towards the negative T wave giving us ST depression, we actually have ST elevation here that's concordant, so in the same direction with that R wave. If we have at least one millimeter of concordant ST elevation and at least one lead anywhere on the EKG, that this would indicate STEMI, and this criterion here actually has the greatest specificity. All right, so next we wanna look for any concordant ST depression. So here we have a predominantly negative S wave, such as in the example here. And again, we'd expect to see the J point discordant to the S wave and pulled towards the positive T wave, giving us ST elevation. But now we see that we actually have concordant ST depression here. If this concordant ST depression is present in at least one of the leads in V1 through V3, and it's at least one millimeter deep, then this is another indicator for STEMI. All right, and then finally, for our last criteria, we need to evaluate the proportionality of the size of the ST elevation when compared to the size or the amplitude of the negative S wave. And this third criteria is actually the, the one that Smith modified from the original Scarboza's criteria, which previously didn't compare the size of the S wave and the uh, ST elevation, and it just looked for a fixed size of ST elevation. Now for this one, what we want to do is measure the amplitude of the ST elevation, and then compare that to the amplitude of the negative S wave. If the ST elevation is greater than or equal to 25% of the amplitude of the depth of the S wave, and this is present in at least one lead anywhere on the EKG, that this is also an indicator of STEMI. So those are the three criteria, and if any of these three criteria are present, then we would conclude that this patient is having a STEMI and treat it just like any other STEMI with our management, cath lab activation, etc. Remember, though, that just because these criteria are not present, it doesn't necessarily mean we can say that this is not a STEMI. All right, and so finally, now that we've covered what the criteria are, let's take a look at a great example of an EKG that will actually show us all three of these criteria present. So in this example, let's start off looking for any concordant ST elevation. Do you see any present here? Hopefully you can see it in three different leads. If you look at our lateral and high lateral leads, you can actually see concordant ST elevation in leads 1, AVL, and V5, all at least 1 millimeter in height. Now with these predominantly positive R waves, remember due to that rule of appropriate T wave discordance, we'd expect to see negative T waves and ST depression, but instead here we have that ST elevation. And seeing this in even just one lead, we could say that this patient is having a STEMI. 
All right, so next, let's look and see if there's any concordant ST depression. Do you see any here? Well, hopefully you're able to spot the two easy ones to identify in our inferior leads, lead 3 and AVF. As you can see, we have predominantly negative S waves. So again, we'd expect to see positive T waves, which we do have here and here, as well as normally we'd expect ST elevation. But instead, here we have ST depression. This is that concordant ST depression. Now, in this example here, the concordant ST depression we see is not present in V1 through V3. Therefore, this example wouldn't be an indicator of STEMI, and what we're probably actually seeing is more in the context of reciprocal changes in the inferior leads due to a high lateral STEMI. But this does serve as a good example of what this concordant ST depression is going to look like. And then finally, we want to look for any disproportionately large ST elevation when we're comparing that to the size or the amplitude of a negative S wave. Do you say anything on here that stands out to you? With this example, it's a little hard to measure since the small boxes are not as clear, but let's look at V4 here to start. Hopefully this one really stands out. If we measure our S wave, I'm guessing that this is about 7 millimeters deep. Looking at our ST elevation, if we guesstimate our J point to be right about here, we have about 4 millimeters of height. So if we divide our ST elevation of 4 by our S wave amplitude of 7, we get 57%, which is way above our criteria of greater than or equal to 25% in at least any one lead. So at this point, we can say that this patient is having a STEMI. Now V1 through V3 are all pretty close to 25%, but again, it's hard to tell for sure in this example. Uh, when you have the actual EKG in front of you, you'll be able to easily read the markings and make your actual measurements. All right, well, hopefully that example helped to show you the three different criteria on an actual 12-lead EKG and what you'd expect to see. The only difference being that concordant ST depression, in order to call it a STEMI, we want to see that in either V1, V2, or V3. Now, it certainly can and will get more difficult to read with some EKGs, but if you take your time and go through your steps with evaluating your EKGs, you'll get better and better at recognizing these different patterns. And this goes not only for Scarboza's criteria, but for all of the different things that we've discussed over the course of this series. The most important thing with all this is for you to go out and put into practice and really get your reps in looking at patients' EKGs constantly and go through the steps of your interpretation and really working to identify the various aspects that we've discussed. It takes time and it takes repetition, but eventually these will become more natural and quicker for you to do. I truly hope that the discussion of all of this over the past many lessons is really going to help to guide you down the path of being able to read and interpret your patient's 12-lead EKGs. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.